Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for calling us to order. Uh, welcome all today uh, to a program that the Shemo is offering in, in uh, collaboration with the Jesuit um, Center here. And on, the, on that note, uh, we are very happy to collaborate with fine um, institutions or organizations, either within or outside the, 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 uh, the university. And today, it is with the Jesuit Center. And so I will turn this mic over to Father uh, Pat Rogers to introduce the speaker. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, we're very excited at the Jesuit Center to be collaborating with you for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them being, of course, just strengthening the ties within a community, uh, an academic community, uh, especially dedicated to the humanities and uh, the talk of the common good is uh, just very Jesuitical. And so it, we're just exceptionally uh, honored and, and pleased to be uh, in collaboration with you. Also, uh, you'll see that uh, our guest today is from the University, Loyola University in Andalusia, Spain. That's in Sevilla, Spain. One of the things that uh, Jesuits are really trying to, to work on, and it's part of a plan for the next uh, decade, is to really increase collaborations, not only among Jesuit universities here in the United States, but around the world. So when I first met Sandra uh, two years ago, when I got to the university, we were discussing things and I asked her about what she did and uh, she was telling me about this humanities initiatives and these things and um, about how we work on things of the common good. And the first thing I thought of was our guest because I've known our guest for many, many years. And this is part of his, uh, what he writes about and what he's dedicated to. And he happens to be from Loyola Andalusia in Spain. So this is just a really great uh, constellation of things coming together. So let me tell you a little bit about Professor Ignacio Sepulveda del Rio. He's originally from Santiago, Chile, but he did his PhD in political philosophy and ethics at Valencia University in Spain. And for the last six years, <clears throat> he's been a professor at Loyola University Andalusia, again, which is in Sevilla, Spain. And he's a professor of humanities and philosophy. So again, the, the whole idea of just wedding the humanities, philosophy, humanities, and economics, all of the classifications begin with humanities there. He's the author of a number of books. 2007, a book called Jesuits in the Deserts in Antofagasta. That's about the Jesuits in the Atacama Desert in the northern part of Chile. Uh, also, a book called um, Revista Mensaje in the History of Chile. Again, so this is a historical, uh, he did editing for this, a historical uh, book on the history of Chile. In 2016, he edited a book called Humanism and Basic, Basic Ethics. He also has been um, uh, at, um, he was a fellow at the Berkeley Center for uh, Peace and World Religions at Georgetown University, where he studied with and worked with Jose Casanova. And he's got a new book coming out next year, uh, based on the way we live religion today and how we can bridge the gap between this radical individu individualism that we see and also what is transcendent. So please welcome to the Shamal Forum, Ignacio Sepulveda del Rio. Muchas gracias por recibirme. Muchas gracias. Don't worry, I won't speak English, uh, Spanish. <laughs> so, you know, I have an accent. Uh, sometimes I get to, uh, I forget the words in English. So if you understand, you can read the subtitles, OK? Or you can translate. Hmm? Today, let me see this. Uh, today, we are going to talk about religion. But please, don't feel, don't think that we are going to pray here. Or I'm going to try to convince you to be a good religious person, okay? You don't have to be Catholic, Jew, or anything like that. We are going to talk about religion as a very important social phenomenon. And I think this phenomenon can be a contribution 
to our society and to our life. That's why I say religion in the public sphere, and I have the question, uh, can contribute to the common good? And I truly believe religion can be a very good contribution to the common, to the common good. I mean, it has to be a very, I will say, a very healthy religion, but it can be very good for our society. Let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move a little bit, but it's okay. Okay, I feel better if I move. So we are gonna talk about religion, and we are gonna talk about religion people. And the question for me is, religion can be, can religion be a contribution for our society? And I think it can be a contribution for our society, but it has to be, or this is going to be a little difficult to do it. Let's see. We have two different concepts here, religion and common good. And I'm gonna try to connect them to make them work. And it's very complicated because they are, they have, as I said yesterday, very bad press, you know? When we are talking about religion in Europe, it's a little different here in the States, but when you are in Europe and you talk about religion in the public sphere, people say, you know what, I don't like religion. <coughs> Why? Because we have problems with religion in Europe. And we rather prefer to have religion into what is called the private sphere. So what I'm trying to do is to say, you know what, religion could be in the public sphere. It could be a very good contribution. And also we have the second concept, which is common good. What do you think what would be uh, a good for society? If we are here, maybe 60 people, I have no idea how many people we have today, but maybe 60 people, we may have 60 different answers. And we are very used to have a very individualistic society. So when we are talking about common good, I'm trying to say, you know what, maybe we can find a way to look and to work for our society in one direction. And religion could be very good for that. Let's go into religion. Religion is a very difficult and complex concept to define. Have you been in a wedding? Everyone has been in a, in a religious wedding. If you, if you are a Catholic or a Jew or a Muslim, you have been in a wedding. The same with a funeral or what we say in Spain, First Communion, uh, Primera Comunión, First Communion. So we have some idea about religion, but the concept is very difficult. And here in our culture, the Western culture, we have a division between, we have a split between what is the religious world and what is the secular world. You know, so we have this the, this difference. Now, if you go to different to different societies, for example, if you go to the Muslim society, you are going to find the dima, and this is a different concept of religion. It's not only about you and God; it's about you, God, society, etc. What I'm trying to tell you is that religion we have we have in our society in our Western culture we have a definition of religion. But in other different cultures, in other different societies, the same word, religion, it doesn't mean the same. And also, right now, religion, it's, it's complicated to define. I'm gonna try to show that a little bit. Trying to define religion. We can talk about religion as a way to be open, I say openness, to transcend us. But also religion is about community. What kind of community? A community that celebrates, celebrates life, celebrates also sometimes when we just go away, to pass away. Uh, religion is also a community that has ritual, that has ways to act, and they are called ethics. Uh, but religion is not only about certain rites or sacrament, it's a way, it's a, it's a very important way to understand uh, life and also what happened after life. So religion is a very powerful thing that moves our lives. Even if we are in the Western world or we are in the other part of the world, we are in the Muslim world or in the his, his, uh, uh, Hinduist world, religion is very important for us. But here in our culture, we have a very we have very bad experience with religion. Uh, 
Do you know, have you had the opportunity to read the Spanish news lately? We have Francisco Franco, you know Francisco Juan Franco was the dictatorship, um, the dictator in, in Spain. And we have a very complicated situation with him, but because the government wants to move him away from El Valle de los Caídos and some Benedictine monks, they don't want them, him, him to be moved. It's, uh, it's complicated. So for, for instance, in Spain, we have this idea that religion is very close to the dictator. And religion is very close to dictatorship. And we have in mind in Europe that religion uh, have very bad issues, for example, with the Spanish Inquisition. You know the Spanish Inquisition? So it's like, okay, we are talking about religion. We are talking about Inquisition. And if you go to Germany, you are going to remember also uh, all this problem with the witches, no? They were burning witches. And even if you are here in the States, you are going to remember Salem. Do you remember the small town of Salem? Uh, Arthur Miller. Hmm? That's I read many years ago, Las Brujas, the witches of Salem, no? So when we are talking about religion, we are afraid and we believe that religion is a problem. It's a problem, why? Because some people say religion kind of wakes violent and irrational feelings in human beings. So we try to say, you know what, I rather prefer to have religion in the private sphere. If you want to practice your religion, you can do it, but you can do it at home. You can do it in your own church. I'm sorry, in your own church, your community. But do, don't bring religion into the public sphere. Because religion is a little complicated. It's a little, let's say, uh, dangerous. Okay? But think about this. Religion is complicated. But what about nationalism? Is nationalism complicated? It's, uh, right now in Spain we have Catalonia, Catalonia, but here in the States you have also nationalism, and sometimes it could be very, very complicated. And sometimes nationalism and religion, they are very, very close. But here we have the thing, that religion always keeps coming back to the public sphere. So if you see, let me go ahead. If you see, there is a, this guy, Jose Casanova. He, Jose Casanova, he's a Spaniard. He was born uh, near Burgos, in Spain. And uh, he works at Georgetown University. And he talks about what is called secularization theory. So when we have this uh, secularization theory, what is this, uh, this about? It means one increasing structural differentiation it means separation of religion from politics, which is very good, very good. The separation between the state and the church. And we are happy with that. Okay, you have the First Amendment here. That's uh, the First Amendment, I think it was uh, 1789. That was the time of the First Amendment here in your constitution. And you have the separation between the church and the state. Also, Jose Casanova says, uh, secularization means privatization of religion, and also he says decline of religious belief. This was the traditional secularization theory during the whole 20th century. Okay, right now we know in our society in the Western world we can say that there is a separation between religion and the state, religion and all the different spheres. But right now we can see that there is no a privatization of religion. Religion is very, very important today. And it was very important during the, the 20th century. For democracy, for human rights. Uh, you remember El Salvador, for instance, and the Jesuits who died in El Salvador. You remember the dictatorship in Chile and the Catholic Church and the way they were the Catholic Church was fighting against Pinochet. So religion is not in the private sphere. And also people are believers. And by, by believers, I'm not saying that people, they, they believe in the Catholic Church or any other church. But in many different ways, we are still believers, which is very, very interesting. Uh, this is a, 
the way we are believers right now, this is a very good question. And that's the question I have in my, in my book, which is coming next uh, December, I think. It's uh, we, we, we are not, I mean, m many, people, many people may say, I'm a Catholic. Yes, you're a Catholic. What kind of Catholic? Do you believe in everything the Catholic Church says? And he's going to say or she's going to say, no, I'm a special kind of Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> And everyone is a special kind of Catholic, even Pope Warriors. <laughs> so, you know, let's go back to this one. Religion is still in the public sphere. And it's coming back every time during, it has been coming back every time during the 20th century. And this idea of the secularization theory, we know this point is very real, but these two points are not that real. Okay? You know this guy? a German philosopher, Jürgen Habermas. Uh, he is not a believer, but in the recent years, maybe in uh, the last 10 years, he has been talking about religion. And he says, right now we are in, in a time of post-secularization, and religions can be a contribution of society. Why? Because they can give us a sense of belonging, a sense of community. <coughs> That's why religion could be very important for our society. Let's go with common good. Are we doing okay with yeah, the time? Sure. Okay, let's well, go. I don't know how much more you have. Yeah, you're doing <laughs> I have a lot to say, so it's like, okay. how, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> Until two o'clock, okay. <laughs> so what is common good? Let's, before I define common good, I would like to say we have a problem with common good because it's a very unclear concept. This is uh, Father Riordan. He's a professor at the Oxford University. He's a Jesuit. And he says this idea of common good is very complicated. And this is very interesting. Why? Because people have different expectations as to what things contribute to the common good. A few nights ago, we were writing this down with Patrick Rogers. He was just uh, checking if I had a, a good English. And he wrote this down. And when he wrote this down, I realized that you had the same idea than Hobbes and Hume, two English philosophers. He's like, you know what? This idea of coming good is very complicated because everyone has a different idea of what the good, the own, the, the, my own good is. So and here we have Hobbes. Do you remember Hobbes? A very important English philosopher. He thinks, or in many ways, he thought that the idea of common good was a very bad idea. At that time, when Thomas Hobbes lived, uh, was alive, there were two different schools. One of them was the school of Salamanca, with some very good Jesuits over there. And the other one, I would say, this is the, the English school with Hobbes and then Locke. Which one won? The second one, Hobbes. And right now, our, our society, we understand our society like a very individualistic society. And at that time in Salamanca, they were talking about a society where we could work together, OK? And uh, we were looking for the same common good. I'm going to try to go a little faster on this. Uh, some key elements of the common good, some key elements. Action, every action of human being is for the sake of some good. Why do you eat? Why do you sleep? For yourself, because you need to live. Uh, and I tell my students, why do you come to this, to, to, to my class, no, this is such a boring class? <laughs> because you want to prove, because you want to get a degree, because you, you want to get a job at the end of the day, a career. So every action we take is for the same of a good. And also, cooperation is a joint action. This is this famous guy, Aristotle. And it end, it, its end is a common good. It's a common good. And the highest association, Aristotle will say, I don't have time to go into this, has the highest good. And he's trying to talk, uh, he talks also about the idea of heuristic. Do you know what heuristic is? That's pretty good, that's a new word, because Patrick didn't know this word too, okay? 
uh, we had to try. We had to discover something for ourselves. Common good is not only something you can see there and it's very clear. As a society, we have tried to discover it. Let's, I'm going to show you a, a, a case, okay, a practical case. Jesuits, you know Jesuits, no? You know, there is a very important, uh, a very important document. It's called Formula del Instituto, Formula of the Institute. And this document has three different reductions. One of them is for 1539, the second one for, from uh, 1540, and the last one from 1550, okay? This document was a way to say what the Jesuits had to do. Uh, it's a, in a way, this document was the first constitution of the Jesuits. Let me get there. Uh, so you see here, they have strived especially for the defense and propagation of the faith. That was at the beginning. They had to take care of the spiritual exercises and the education of children and unliterate persons. Are you doing this? Hmm? No, they're all lettered here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, they had to reconcile the stranger. S stranger? Hmm? Thank you. <laughs> they have to assist and, the, and serve those in prisons or hospital. And at the end, they had to look, they had to work for the common good. If you see all the other things that I read, they belong to Mark chapter 25. Do you remember Mark? Chapter 25. I'm talking about the Gospel of Mark. Hmm? Matthew. Matthews. Thank you very much. It's uh, my English. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> so Matthew, Mark. <laughs> Mateo, Mateo 25. So, so they belong to Mateo 25, and this is so different because uh, I will say, like, come on, good is not a religious thing, but it's a, like more a civil thing, a political thing. Okay. So why is common good part of this formula? Because between the first formula of the Instituto, 1539, and the last one, 1550, they have some work to do. The Society of Jesus had to get schools, they had to preach, they had to work with the people. So for, for instance, let's see what they did at that time. They had pharmacies. Can you see a Jesuit priest just running a pharmacy? What do you need, sir? Hmm? I can give it to you. Houses for convertidas. What were the convertidas? ex prostitutes So they, San, Ignacio, uh, San Ignatius in Rome, he decided that the, the house of Santa Marta at that time, that was a very important work for Jesuits. They had to take this uh, woman and they had to try to give them a good way to get married. At that time, we are talking about 500 years ago. And also, they were very concerned about cultural life, to educate students in a very wise sense, and with a special concern to the civic life. Civic life for the first Jesuit was very, very important. Utilitas justicia humanitas et fide. This is part of what is called the Ratio Estudiorum. That's the way Jesuits educated and still educate people. You know those words, no? Utilitas, what is utilitas? Utility, justice, humanities, and faith. So if you want to have a Jesuit education, if you are a young man or a woman, and you want to be educated in the with the, the Jesuit education, you need to go through this. You have to be very good in what you are doing, the professional stuff. But also, you have to think about justice. You have to think about human beings. That's why they have humanities. And also, you have to be open to faith. You see, this is a very, very practical education. One story about this. I teach, as you know, I teach philosophy at the university. 
Uh, one of the parts that I have to teach is about civil life, engagement with the civil life, human rights, and justice. I like to teach them your roles, Adela Cortina, a famous Spanish philosopher, and other different philosophers. What is most important for them is that, is that I take them to the field to practice justice. So we have this, uh, this stuff is called aprendizaje servicio, service learning. You know service learning, no? It's like, okay, we are gonna talk about justice. How? We are gonna go to work with people who are, they need justice. What kind of people? Immigrant, immigrants. In Spain, we have a lot of people from Africa. And they are coming, and also from the eastern part, from Syria and different places. So we had to go to work with immigrants. Also, we had to go with poor people. We had to work different different kind of people, even women, uh, gay people, etc., etc. If you want to know about justice, you have to practice justice. That's very important. Okay. Francisco Suarez. Francisco Suarez. Uh, he is a very a very important uh, Jesuit philosopher. You can see he was born 1588. That was the time the Society of Jesus was founded. And he died 1617. And he was from Granada, Spain. Uh, this is a very nice picture we have of him. He was very ugly. Hmm? But, <laughs> but he was a very good philosopher. <laughs> now, what is common good from, for Francisco Suarez? He says, uh, common good has direct relation with justice, of course, in relation with the political community. If we are talking about common good, we are talking about the political community, and we are talking about justice. You cannot separate common good from justice or political society. And I'm going to say more. You cannot separate faith from justice. And the Jesuits, Jesuits are very, uh, very hard on this. Uh, you have a, how do you say your uh, general congregation? It's uh, the option for faith and justice. They had to go together. So by a special agreement, he says, of will or common consent, men, I'm sorry, men and women, are integrated into a political body with a social bond to help each other in order to a political end. So Francisco Suarez, his paradigm, his idea, was so much different from Hobbes' idea. Francisco Suarez wasn't thinking about individualism. He was thinking about community, and community looking for a common good. Uh, let's go. Please remember what the question was at the beginning. How can the practice of religion contribute to the common good in a pluralistic, democratic society? This society, Spanish society, French society, different societies. That's the main question for me. And I think religion can be a real contribution because religion has, can be very prophetic. Do you know him? Mandela, Martin Luther King, and this man, do you know him? Ignacio Yacuria, a Spanish, uh, Spanish Jesuit. He was killed in El Salvador hmm, with all the martyrs of El Salvador. So religion has this uh, very strong force. It has been for many, many centuries before Christ. About this idea of capacity to denounce situations of injustice or oppression. And today, what injustice we have? Migration, ecology, economy, the whole human being and the whole creation. And also religion can look for justice. A very healthy religion can look for justice. It goes from denounced justice, from denounced injustice, I think, um, and justice seeks to amend the relationship with the other, with nature, and with the cosmos. Put the correct order for all things even more appeal to love. You have to remember, for, example, for instance, Laudatio Si, 
Do you know Laudatio Si? No? It's, uh, it's the Pope Francis encyclical. Hmm? He wrote it a few, a couple of years ago, three, maybe three, year, three years ago. Well, on the environment. And uh, this is very interesting because uh, Laudatio Si says ecology is about the relationship between human being and nature. And there is a connection with, one, with, the, with injustice with all human beings and also with the situation of nature. So ecology is not about only just uh, plastic or just uh, to take care of trees. It's about taking care of human beings. It's to get a more, let's say, justice uh, society. And also it's a new way, a more complex way, to understand what is called uh, development. You know, 50 years ago, people were talking about development, no? And they say, so how much money each person in your country makes? Do it make sense? And right now, when we are talking about development, people say it's not only about money, it's about quality of life, that you need a better quality of life. And in that quality of life, of course, you need a community, a better community. Also, it's about solidarity. In time of nationalistic, xenophobic discourse, we need solidarity. And here I have a new word for you, aporophobic, aporophobic. My master in Spain, Adela Cortina, uh, a philosopher, she made up this word. And right now we are using this word in our country in Spain. What it means? Phobia, do you know phobia? What is phobia? It's fear. Fear to what? To a poro. A poro is the poor. A poor. Because when uh, are we afraid of me immigrants? When they are poor. But if you receive a rich guy, you're going to say a rich immigrant. Hmm? You're going to say, it's OK. Come this way. We need your money. But we are so afraid of the poor. And Adela Cortina is so right. We need to try to change this, not being afraid of the poor, and also not being afraid of the throwaway. The, the Pope uses this, the Pope Francis uses this word throw away, those who are excluded. And also religion can be a very good way to work community and citizenship, being open to the other, Practicing solidarity allow us to generate a sense of community. I think in this way religion could be a very, a very good contribution to our uh, political community. Also, religion could be a contribution of hope and meaning in, a very, in, a, in this time of despair. Uh, when you talk to young people many times, even not, not, not only young people, maybe older people, you are going to feel that people are not very happy right now. We have too many things going on in politics, economy, ecology. And religion, in many ways, can be a way to give us more hope, to say, you know what, we can work together. We can unify ourselves as a community, and we can get some stuff done. OK, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Before you began speaking, we were talking about my trip to Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. And one of the speakers that I heard in Williamsburg several years ago was talking about religion in colonial Williamsburg. And that his interpretation was freedom from religion, yeah. not freedom of religion. And that's what we were talking about now, just before, just before you began to speak. Mm -hmm. And I can see what you're saying, that religion gives us an opportunity to become whole, 
reminds me of listening this morning on NPR and they were talking about children and, and Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. Sure. So what you're saying is that it takes religions to make a community to raise a child. Mm -hmm. But I'm still afraid of religion. Although I'm a practicing Presbyterian UCC member, proudly, mm -hmm. I'm still afraid of certain religions and not non-Christian. I'm afraid of some Christian religions. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid of the power that they have which is changing so many perspectives about the fact that all people have a right to live. All people have a right to live. And that there are some religions who are saying, well, maybe not all people. Or not all people can live the way we want to live. And that's what scares me. Yeah. So it's really not a question, it's a comment, but I, <laughs> I apologize. I'm sorry, what, what's your name? It's Ricky. Ricky. Mm. Well, thank you very much. It's a very good comment. It's, a, it's not a question, but it's a, you are right about it. You are right. I, I'm afraid of human beings. I'm truly afraid of human beings because uh, we tend to be very fundamentalistic. We believe that our nation is the best in the world. We believe that our ideas, philosophical ideas, capitalism or socialism or Marxism are the best in the world. Uh, we believe that secularization is awesome. And everyone should be secularized. secularized. Uh, for instance, a hundred years ago in Turkey, with Ataturk, the father of the modern Turkey, they, he decided that no woman was allowed to wear the veil, no? And they were just forcing women to take out the veil. If you go to the French Revolution, you are going to find the same. Uh, secularization, very secular people, and they were so against religion, any kind of religion. And they were, they were very violent. So. I'm really afraid of human beings because we have this tendency to think that our way to look into the world is the best way and we have to impose this way to other people. What can we do with that? We have to talk, we need a strong community, we need to go, for instance, for religion, we need to go into the gospel on the origin of religion. Even even those who are not believers, uh, the gospel is talking about, about love, about respect, about no judgment. And we have to go back into that. In Spain, there is a, a test for this. It's called the Prueba del Algodón. So the test, uh, the cotton test. Uh, if, if this one, if this uh, stuff is clean, you can pass a cotton, uh, a little bit of cotton here, and you're going to be if this one, this uh, stuff is clean, okay? About religion, you have to ask, is this religion open? Are they loving? Uh, is this religion open to be, um, to practice solidarity? Yes, it is. They are taking care of the poor, they are taking care of the migrant, they are taking care of the widow. Yes, they are. If they are not, they are not passing the cotton test. Mm -hmm. They are not passing the cotton test. Mm -hmm. So, what, what about um, kind of civic responsibility, with or without religion? Uh, is it you, do you think that do you think that religion is a necessary component in having a civil life and having a, a, a respecting the common good? Sure, I think it's a, very, it's a very important component there. It's not the only one. And when, for, for instance, when you, when you go into the, the history of democracy in England, even in Spain or France, or even here in the States, you're going to find that many people, many believers, they wanted to, to go into the civic uh, responsibility because they were believers. Of course, 
you may not be a believer, and you also may be a very good person, and you have a very important responsibility, civic responsibility. I think religion is one part of the puzzle, one part of the puzzle. Two uh, questions. One is, where do you see atheists fitting into your uh, discussion of religion in the public sphere? And the second, going to the other extreme, um, how do you see the Pope carrying out uh, religion in the public sphere and contributing to the common good? Well, you know, I feel very close to atheists more than believers. It's uh, because I'm a philosopher, and so in many ways, I'm a weird believer. No? Uh, I have to confess that. Uh, atheists are very important, very, very important. Because I'm talking about atheists, and also I'm talking about those who have no idea if they are atheists or, or, uh, or believers. No? Uh, but they are very important in this, because they can I, I really think that sometimes atheists, they have the right questions and they are able to confront believers and to make very good questions to believers. And, it's, uh, and that's very important because believers sometimes they, they think they have the whole truth in this. And atheists can be like the other part of the, the other part of the puzzle. An atheist can love humanity. And that's big, that's huge. And in some way, I don't want to baptize atheists, but in some way, it's uh, when they believe in, hu in humanity, when they believe in human beings, that's one way to practice love, hmm? a very open love. About the Pope, I think we have a very good Pope right now, hmm? a very good Pope, and he's very open. Hmm? Uh, it's a very good Pope for those who are Catholic, and especially it's a very good pope for those who are not Catholic. Because right now he's, he's doing what the, Catholic, the, the Vatican II tried to do. He's opening all the windows, all the doors of the church, and he's trying to receive a new air, a new breeze inside the church. And that's very important. And I think uh, the church is going to be better right now. I'm not, I'm not saying that the, church, the Catholic church is gonna have more people. <laughs> I don't believe it. Maybe they are going to have less people. But it's going to be a much better church in many, many ways. Many ways. I was sometimes a practicing Christian. I guess what bothers me about religion is interpretation. Uh, I'm thinking specifically, Elijah, to something that Maury said. Uh, it's always bothered me in the so called Lord's Prayer. The passage or the phrase that says, lead us not into temptation. And I've always thought it was a bad interpretation. If, if God is omniscient, if God is omnipotent, that I've been taught since I was very little, why would he lead us into temptation? And I've asked a number of clergy people from all religions about that, and they say, well, Don, that's what we've been taught. <laughs> Several months ago. And you have to obey. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe it's been within a year. Uh, the Pope himself, because that very thing, and I feel vindicated because I've been saying it for years, uh, brought that up and said that he was going to have it further research. So I'm wondering how much of our lives uh, just revolve around things that have been misinterpreted. Uh, like I'd just like to hear your comment. Wow. <laughs> what do you want me to say? It's like a... Make me feel better. <laughs> Jesus Christ loves you. So it's like, a, I agree with you. Uh, religion, I say religion is very complicated because those who are preaching religion are human beings. And we like to make things in our way. We like to manipulate people. So when you, for instance, in the Catholic Church, we, when you don't have very strong leaders with a lot of, a lot of power, you're able to have 
uh, a more free religion. Mm? Does it make sense? Mm? I mean, many years ago, I remember when I was back in Chile, the Catholic priest was everything. And what he said was everything. Mm? And you had to listen to the, to the Father, El Padre. Mm? And right now, we are able to, to talk. We are able to question. We are able to say, to say, you know what? I would like to talk about this stuff. Mm? And we had to generate a dialogue. We had to integrate priests, we had to integrate laymen, and especially lay women. Lay women are very important. I'm not quite sure if I answer you, but. Uh, Thank you. You're very welcome. Just a little follow up. A follow up to the discussion you just had. Uh, how important is leadership, and how important are the the masses? Does power, uh, or does the common good work its way up? Does it work its way down? Um, what's the interrelation there? Oof, um, the, the masses, you are talking about the mass, not the, the holy mass, no? OK. Yeah. OK, I just wanted to know. Uh, Masses are very, very complicated. Hmm? So I, I would like to, to, to quote Kant. Uh, am I saying right, Kant? Uh, Emmanuel Kant? So, sapere aude, sapere aude. Uh, think by yourself. That's very important. We have to teach people to think by themselves. Uh, we are not used to do that. In our religions, we like to have sheeps. Sheeps? Hmm? Uh, in democracy, we like, we like to have buyers, stupid people. Hmm? We like to have consumers. They, they, they have to consume. Don't ask, just keep uh, buying the new Apple phone. Hmm? I have no idea the, the iPhone. No? And that's crazy. We don't like that. So we need sapere aude. Try to think again. And if young people go to college, we have to teach them how to think. If they go to school, don't take out philosophy. Right now in, in Spain, they try to take out philosophy. And all people say, you know what? We cannot take this out. Because in many ways, philosophy, I'm not saying that because I'm going to have a job, but well, I'm going to have a job. Uh, it's important. But philosophy, in many ways, is the way you can be critic to a society. That's the way you are not a, just a, a buyer, a buyer in our society. Uh, your thoughts on what it takes to restore the notion of transcendence to the public sphere it seems to me that the biggest missing um, I've lived in Spain as you know for two years and here and mm. missing is, is Can you speak up, please, pa? or maybe? No, it's just don't, don't, don't hit that button. <laughs> it, it seems that what unites Spain and the U.S., having lived in both countries for the past few years, is mm -hmm. not necessarily the absence of religion in the public sphere, but at least the absence of a devotion to the idea of transcendence. It's, it's not even in our conversations yet what's, what haunts all of us, atheists or believers or not. How can that, that concept be addressed publicly without being scoffed at, as I am in Spain when I talk about it? It, 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 it seems to, be, to thread the needle more than, than religion or faith. Yeah. That's a very good question. He's asking about transcendence, the idea of transcendence, that right now we don't have it in our societies. We don't speak about transcendence in our society. Uh, transcendence, Patrick, how do you say transcendence? Transcendence, yeah. To go further this own life. Uh, to, go to go beyond this life. Transcendence about the, uh, if you're talking about transcendent, that which can't be seen. So again, anything spiritual, a transcendent uh, idea would be something beyond or 
idea of transcendent is God. You know, God. Yeah, God, yeah. So what book or even God that is beyond our realm of, of physical knowledge. But yeah. So if something transcendent is beyond that. You know, that's a very good question and it's a very complicated question uh, because first we have the concept of transcendence, which is very complicated and we had to define it very well. It's not only about believing in God, it's about just to feel that there is another way or let's say another life or another moment, if you are a Buddhist, another moment. There's one thing. And the concept right now, the concept of, uh, I would like to put together transcendence with spirituality. Right now, many teachers, many professors are working about how to teach a spiritual intelligence to the kids. I'm not saying this that you had to pray the Our Father and go to church. It's like you had to feel, you had to have a sense of a spirituality, a very broad sense of spirituality in your life. Right now in Spain, some Jesuits high school, they are working on this. And they are trying to get new answer, uh, answers how to do this. Because we teach kids how to behave, how to learn math, how to learn Spanish, English, or history, or whatever. But we don't explain them how to get related to their own sense of transcendence that every human being has that feeling. Even if you are an atheist, you are going to have that feeling. But right now in our society, we don't teach our kids how to do it. Just one, one story. We were, uh, we were having drinks at your house, Steve. Hmm? And one of the young kids, they, he said, he was your son. <laughs> <laughs> he said he lived, uh, he had a, a room on the, on the upper part of the house, okay? And he was looking at the atardecer. How do you say atardecer? Uh, sunset. The sunset. And every time he looked at the sunset, he had a very powerful feeling of God, spirituality, and transcendence. We got to teach our people how to feel that, even if they are not believers, and how to be able to connect with that feeling, with that intelligence. Uh, they're doing it in California and a number of other states in the Union. And what they're trying to do is teach meditation to kids, especially children from troubled backgrounds, yeah. domestic violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, that sort of thing. And they find that when those kids meditate, and they've interviewed the kids, New York Times have had a number of articles, they can connect better, they calm down, they don't get argumentative, they don't fight, their um, relationships with other children are good, and they do better in school. And there's a new term for it. They don't just call it meditation anymore. Guys, what do they call it? There's Mindfulness. Right, right. Mindfulness, right. And they're finding that it's very, very effective. And of course, some religious groups, you know, argue about that. But anybody who's any sort of a free thinker seems to think that it's working and it's effective. You're right. You're right. It's a ghost. Someone is around here. For a long time, I made, I was a university chaplain or campus minister, but always in secular institutions. And one of them was Harvard. And the reason that that seemed germane to the conversation we're having now is United Ministry at Harvard is recognized as by the university as the association of chaplains who have permission to work on the university campus with students, okay. And there were some basic rules you had to agree to to become a member. You had to have a group of students already there. You couldn't come and they used to use it. It wasn't a fishing license is what yeah. they used to say. Okay, so that was one. Two was that you would had to agree to respect religious traditions that were not necessarily your own. And the third was that you had to demonstrate respect 
not in theory, but in practice, to all of your colleagues in United Ministry and to the student denominations that we've served. Okay, so eight years of trying to get that to work. I, I, hey, what, be, what me is that a lot of my colleagues had that same desire to build a common good that was funded by their religious tradition, which was not mine. So I was Christian, but my Muslim and my Jewish mm -hmm. and my Hindu, the traditions of their community brought us to the, to the same place in terms of what we wanted to create, which was a civil and just society. And one day looked at us and said, it was a person who never did join the group because he couldn't agree to conditions that I just said. He looked at me and he said, well, all I can say is you're much more interested in orthopraxis than orthodoxy. And I was like, you know what, you're right. I'm interested in how you behave in the world. Yeah. And however you get there, including my sitting next to me neighbor um, there, who was uh, the leader of the Atheist Humanist Society on campus, as long as we were treating each other with respect, it really, it, we came to agree that it was orthopraxis we were interested in more than orthodoxy. Yeah. Yeah, the difference between orthopraxis and our orthodox orthodoxia, it's uh, the good practice or the good belief, you know? And uh, you are right, you are right. That's what we had to do. We are looking for common good. And I, and I truly believe we can agree on a few things. And we can say, you know what, I believe in this, and we can practice. If, even if you are an atheist, a Catholic, a Jew, whatever you are, you can look for the same good, and we can work together. But sometimes we are so focused that we are so different, uh, and we are so special. So we think, no, he's so different. For instance, uh, I really like when you have a public school in Spain, and you have kids who are Catholic and kids who are Muslims. And they can share their own experience and they are friends. So what's about uh, the Semana Santa? Semana Santa, the, the Easter week, is a huge event in Seville. What, about, what, what is that for you? Well, this is very important. And for you, your, your practice of uh, the Islam, how do you feel? That's very important. If we share as a community, in, in, in not only in high school, but I'm talking about the lower grades, we can have a very good community and we can think that we are different, but we can do the same stuff. It's beautiful here in the States. A few years ago, I had a conversation with a professor of, uh, from, uh, from Georgetown University. Uh, he said to me, uh, my grandfather was German. and uh, He became a citizen, a real citizen his grand-grandfather, a real citizen of this country because uh, he went to the war and fight for our nation. And now Muslim people, they are doing the same. I'm not in favor of war, but I understand that we have a community and we are fighting for that community. Even if you are Muslim or if you are a Christian or you are a Jew or you are an atheist. Orthopraxis. Orthopraxis to do the good, and we can recognize it. We can recognize it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Um, uh, Jill. Jill Doherty will be here on the 29th of this month. I think that's the next one, yes? See you there. Thank you.